from Austin, Texas. It's The Cube, covering OpenStack Summit 2016. Brought to you by the OpenStack Foundation and headline sponsors, Red Hat and Cisco. Now here are your hosts, Brian Gracelee and John Walls. And welcome back to Austin, Texas, here at the OpenStack Summit 2016, our continuing coverage here on theCUBE, along with Brian Gracely, I'm John Walls, and we've heard a lot about diversity as being a really uh, key value proposition that OpenStack brings to uh, the enterprise, and I think diversity within the OpenStack community itself is a point worth talking about, and what we're going to talk about here with Allison Randall, who is the distinguished technologist at HPE, and Allison, thanks for joining us, we appreciate that. Specifically, um, uh, the women, in OpenStack. I know you're a, a member of that group and looking to bring uh, perhaps a, a different flavor, if you will, to the OpenStack community. And why women in OpenStack? You know, what's the key motivation or the mission behind that group? And how well are you doing right now, you think, to accomplishing what you're setting out to do? I mean, I think when you think about diversity, it's important to put it in the perspective of if your community is not diverse, you're only getting about half or even a quarter or less of the potential contributors you could get. Um, and it's not just about number of contributors, it's about unique perspectives, uh, unique value that different people can bring to the table. Um, you know, if you have a community that's, that's sort of monocultural, you, you will tend to get stuck in a rut you know, of one way of thinking of things or one way of doing of things. Whereas if you could bring in that diversity, and you know, we talk a lot about women in OpenStack, but I really think diversity is also about cultural diversity mm -hmm. as well, and you know, country of origin and all of these factors. Um, and diversity of skills. If you can bring in those, those more diverse aspects, you end up with a much richer, much stronger project. You know, when, when I look at, uh, uh, at what you're attempting to do, or at least some of those discussions that you're having, um, it's multifaceted, the ways you could go about it. Um, education, a piece of that. Mentoring, a piece of that. Uh, community discussion, a piece of that. I mean, how do you pull all those areas together and, and I guess what's the value in addressing all of those as a means to an end? I mean, I suppose it's like any campaign. You can't just like focus on one set of troops in the corner. You have to look over the whole piece to get the whole strategy coming together. Mm -hmm. um, there's some more pieces as well to it. One of them is, is recognizing the contributions of non-technical contributors. That's one area we're working on this cycle. Uh, so sort of you have the ATCs who are the technical contributors, but creating a new category that's like active community contributors, or we don't have the name exactly yet, uh, so that people who organize working groups or, or bring together uh, user group meetings that they get recognized for their contributions as well. Um, and another thing is metrics. So it's very easy to measure lines of code or number of commits, but it's harder to measure people who contribute in ways that don't have a digital footprint. Um, so finding the ways to, to actually measure the work that people are doing, the diverse ways that people are contributing to OpenStack. We're seeing more and more, it, it's, an, it's always an interesting thing in terms of diversity. We're seeing you know, HPE uh, run by Meg Whitman, we see IBM. So some of the largest technology companies now have uh, women leading the company. Um, we see uh, you know, that happening in you know, Ford Motor and a number of, what, what do you find as you're, as you're running the programs, as you're talking to people, what motivates them sometimes as you're talking to university uh, people to say, that's, that's my inspiration. Does it, does it need to be women at the top? Does it need to be women um, you know, that have background like yourself that have run really interesting engineering projects? Is there, I, don't, I doubt there's one single formula, but do you find as you talk to people, they go, that inspires me more than that inspires me? I mean, I think, I think the most important piece is something they can identify with. Yeah. So for whoever, whoever they are, wherever they're headed, um, if they can't see anyone in that community that seems a little bit like them, yeah. if they can't find any place to hook in where they feel comfortable, then that will tend to drive them away. So, so it is about examples, and it's kind of about examples in all different, in all different spaces. Sure, sure, that makes um, sense, that makes sense. Um, you've got a long background in, in open source. Uh, you know, um, you were used to run OzCon when it was, uh, you know, here, it's coming back. It's coming yeah. to, to Austin for the first time, and um, you're now at HPE, which, you know, tr while they, are involved with open uh, source wasn't, you know, you wouldn't think of them traditionally as an open source company like a Canonical, like a Red Hat. Um, talk about, you know, just how you're trying to, to bring diversity in terms of just understanding open source as a business model, as a strategy to a company that hadn't done that traditionally. Yeah, so it, it's interesting. So HP had a history of open source in Linux. Yes. 
but it was uh, sort of a, a subset. It was kind of focused on the hardware. And I think OpenStack really was uh, a gateway drug, in mm -hmm. a sense, for open source at HP. You know, realizing, so the way open source is changing is, is like from about 2010 to 2015, or actually if you go all the way back to 2000 to 2010, you went to about 50% corporate adoption, uh -huh. and then up to 2015, you go up to like about 78% open source adoption. Yeah. And the, the, the shift that's happened is now open source innovation is actually driving technology innovation. And it's kind of in this game, if, if your competitors are, are using open source and you're not, um, you're, you're left out. Yeah. Um, and I think more and more companies are realizing this, and now they're, they're coming to the table and they're like, okay, first of all, what, what open source projects should we be delivering to customers, but then also how should we make strategic investments into those open source projects? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because you can't just sort of sit back and expect everything to grow in a way that's helpful. Right. Um, there are always areas where resources are lacking and if you can help out, um, you can make sure that, that the project moves more quickly in a healthy direction. Yeah, yeah. So what's the message that you're bringing uh, in your role as Distinguished Technologist, which again, I, I mentioned that earlier, it's a title we all would love to have. <laughs> um, so um, uh, kudos for that. But, but what, what is the message that you're taking out into the various uh, business partners and clients with whom you deal with in terms of um, trying to help them develop their new strategies, perhaps change their way of thinking, and some of these are really deep-seated fundamental changes that you have to try and bring about, I would think. So the customers come in at different levels. So the very first level is always if you aren't using open source, you're missing out. So like, if you're too afraid to use it, um, your competitors, I guarantee, are using it and you're missing out. But once you get past that stage, the next stage is effective engagement. Um, so historically, there was a problem with companies who would get into open source and they would just kind of like trample all over it or they'd pour a lot of money in something that's really entirely useless. Um, so being, being involved and listening and, and really understanding how the open source projects work and then contributing in ways that are beneficial to the projects and beneficial to the company. Um, a metaphor I use is it's, it's like uh, sustainable forests. Um, so trees are completely free, anyone can go cut them down and they can build a business model on selling furniture or house frames or whatever from the trees. But if you just cut them down and you don't think about sustainability, the trees will just dry up and go away. So, so you have to think about the sustainability of the forests <clears throat> that you're building your businesses on. Right, now what about the receptivity then to the message? Um, because I would assume, again, you run across the whole gamut. You have people who are all ears and eyes and they get it, and then you probably run into a bit of resistance, a little stone wall that says, no, I like the way things are going now. Uh, although if I heard from you, the, the point that you just made, if you don't like it, that's fine, your competitors do. That'd get my <laughs> attention. But what, what, what is the gamut of, of, uh, of reception you're getting? I, so one of the things that surprised me when I went to HP was how incredibly receptive they were to the message. Because if you think about it, it's a 75-year-old company, right? You would expect them to be sort of traditionalists. And they are, in many ways. But um, they totally get that the next generation of pretty much every aspect of software at HPE is going to have, be touched by open source in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And the hardware too, because it has to run open source. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think you can probably tell we're almost at closing time here. You hear some of the banging, so we apologize for that, uh, for the audio in the background there, but, uh, but that just the way, it, that the case <laughs> it is right now. If we go back to the, the uh, women in OpenStack, if we could just for a moment, um, one of the aspects that I found to be interesting is the mentoring program mm -hmm. uh, that's going on. Uh, you've got the GNOME outreach program, and then how it's looking to root down as low as the elementary level uh, in terms of trying to educate and get, get young women, young ladies interested in the technologies that really they're going to guide us here in the future. I mean, how, how do you reach down to that level and inspire that kind of thinking? I think it is incredibly important to start young because the hard thing is it's often in high school that women get the idea that they can't do technology. Um, Little kids, like they have no preconceptions about what they can or can't do. And I know for me, my dad started me programming when I was about six, seven, eight. <laughs> um, and that just left me with a whole life of no hesitation whatsoever. Yeah. So I think the more we can push it down to that level, the better off we'll be. Part of it is parents. 
So parents who are technologists who are willing to work with their kids, that's a huge influence. But another part of it is the school system. Sure. Um, yeah. Getting technology to that level. Yeah, I know. I, I see that with my daughters. I mean, their school has a, a partnership with Lego and, and you know, it's about building things and it's, it's sort of engineering without it feeling like it's engineering. It's creativity. It's, it's, you know, think about a problem, try and be creative. There are now programming languages like Scratch where you don't really think you're programming. You're just kind of making fun things happen. That's, and you're right, you have to get them to be excited about problem solving, excited about being creative and, and again, build confidence. That's, that to me is the biggest thing is, you know, give them confidence, give them examples, um, get them started early, let them feel like they can be creative, let them feel like they're, they're independent, you know. Yeah, they, it's those, a paintbrush. Yeah, and those, and those skills are going to help them in a whole lot of different ways. That's fantastic. So, I, you know, this is a pretty rich, diverse community in terms of technology. Uh, you've got a rich technology background. What here kind of, you know, is, is scratching that technology itch for you that you're, you know, kind of looking at, wanting to dig a little bit deeper in, or, or you know, has your fancy right now? Yeah, I think, so I think one of the most interesting things about OpenStack is, and I, I sometimes use the metaphor, it's like the Linux kernel. Yeah. It's a, an integration layer for drivers underneath the user space, but the user <laughs> space is no longer a single compute instance. The user space is thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of compute instances. Yeah. Um, so it, it really, so it's a step up in abstraction in computing, and that opens up a lot of very interesting application areas. My, my background is DevOps, so CICD is enormously interesting for me, especially at the scale of you know, doing, doing the testing for OpenStack as a development project, but also for customers doing massive scale deployments. You need massive scale testing to go right, with it. Right, you think about what Monty Taylor and his whole team, I mean, they do an amazing job. Exactly. And he doesn't get enough credit and kudos for what, what his team pulls together every six months or every, every few days, actually. So. That's fantastic. What, what's your, what's, you know, sort of takeaway from how big this has gotten? Um, you know, how do you look at something that, that's grown this big from something this small? How do you, do you look at it and say, it's just the natural part of technology, it's going to continue to get big, or is there something unique that you sort of see in this community versus others you've been involved with? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly not guaranteed. There's plenty of small projects that go nowhere. Yeah. I think, I think the reason is because it is specifically a commons. OpenStack is a commons in somewhat the same way as a Linux kernel. It's, it's an open doorway for so many different things to come together, yeah. and that makes it really exciting for vendors to talk to each other. It makes it a really exciting place for customers to talk to vendors and to talk to developers, and um, I, I think it is that very nature. Like, you'd never get, oh, say, a very small, like a proprietary project, you wouldn't get this kind of dynamic activity around one proprietary project. Yeah. It's about access and it's about innovation. Yeah, that's great. Well, Allison, we want to thank you uh, for taking time to be with us today. I believe this is the first time on theCUBE, is that correct? Yeah. First timer, and, and I know for sure the first time we've had a research linguist uh, with a specialty in East <laughs> Africa. So uh, uh, congratulations on that front too. Probably the first and only, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken. There but you thank go. you again for the time and best of luck in the Women in OpenStack initiative. Thanks. We appreciate that. So Allison Randall from HPE, we'll be back with some final thoughts here from OpenStack Summit 2016 and just a bit from Austin. Live from Austin, Texas.